First Kings 18 it says, um, Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people <laughs> didn't answer him a word. I'm sorry, that makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> Elijah, the prophet of God, gives them two options. Choose God, choose Baal. What do they choose? Not to choose. They chose to waver, to play it down the middle. And it's like, you don't get that option. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, en encourage us today to clarity. Encourage us to boldness. Encourage us to hear your voice and to obey. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The setting for what I just wrote is, read is Mount Carmel. Elijah the prophet is challenging the false prophets of the false god, gods of Baal and Ashtoreth. He's made them a challenge. He says, my God, Yahweh, versus your God, false gods. Okay, Most people in Israel have abandoned God at this point. The God of the Bible is not popular. Baal is popular. Ashtoreth is popular. They're a whole lot more fun in some ways they seem, because they allowed you just to sin and do whatever you want. Baal is the in God with the in crowd. In other words, the people of Israel are in trouble at this point because their hearts have grown cold toward God and they've chosen rather to, to follow the crowd than to follow the God of the Bible. And history tells us that in 100 years after this incident in, in 1 Kings 18 on Mount Carmel, 150 years later, those people will be sent into exile because of their rebellion against God. Now in mercy... God, though, at this point has sent Elijah to call them to repentance, to save their generation from such unneeded destruction so that God, uh, people would know that God is God. But before the showdown, Elijah throws down this challenge to Israel. How long will you be ambivalent? How long will you follow the crowd while at the same time thinking you're following God, you need to choose. Is it God or Baal? Right now, you don't want to reject God. You don't think that's right. But at the same time, you don't want to reject Baal completely either. But you can't serve both. And how do people respond? Silence. They're stuck in their wavering. Why? Maybe it's ignorance. Maybe they've not been taught well enough. Maybe the parents haven't taught the children well enough. Maybe it's a fear of commitment. A lot of people are afraid, of, if I commit to something, then I've got to go that direction. There's implications for that. Maybe it's a lack of clear values, uncertain about their priorities. They're not clear on what really matters. So often when people waver on decisions, it's because they don't, they're not clear on what really matters most, values and priorities. Maybe it's a lack of courage. They just don't want to look foolish among everybody else. I mean, they don't, want, they don't want to be part of the in crowd. They don't want to be part of the unpopular crowd. You know, everybody believes, most people believe a certain way, and it's really hard to say, no, I don't believe that. I'm not going to go along with that. Take some courage. So they want to keep their options open. Bottom line, they lack moral clarity. They don't want to take a stand. And so Elijah calls them out. One commentator noted that on Mount Carmel, Elijah was working to warm hearts that had grown cold. When a person is freezing one, to death, one preacher said, he feels a pleasant numbness that he doesn't want to end. He just goes to sleep as he's freezing to death. But when the heat is applied, the blood begins to rush into the affected areas, pain immediately occurs. Though it hurts, the pain is indicative of rescue and cure. God sends Elijah to the people who are cold in their relationship with God, spiritually freezing to death, though they want to stay that way. The prophet turns the heat on. They become angry with him when he's actually working to make them better, to bring them healing, to bring them to God. He's even often accused of causing their pain, the writer says. 
many ministers have noticed there's this trend these days. Maybe it's primarily with churches in Northern Virginia. Maybe not. But people just don't like to make advanced commitments. Again, maybe it's clear, lack of clear values, priority confusion. I think sometimes people just want to keep their options open. They're afraid that if they make a commitment, they'll miss out on something else. But what will happen so often in the church is that somebody will put out a sign-up event for some, a sign-up sheet for some event, and only the most dedicated will actually write down their names and make a commitment. Most will wait until the last minute or even after the deadline to see if they can get an extension for making their commitment. It happens when we've done capital campaigns. You know, there's some people, there are people who are really clear and they're really committed and they will commit and they will go public and, and they will seek God and, and make a godly, you know, and follow what they believe God has called them to do. And then there are people that's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to commit. I'm afraid I'll not be able to keep my commitments. I'm afraid it'll be too hard. I'm afraid I'll miss out on options that I want to follow in the future. So Elijah Elijah's question couldn't be more timely, could it? Are you wavering between two opinions? Is there a commitment God is calling you to where you're hesitating? How long will you hesitate? Reminds me of the story of a man named Homer. Homer finally worked up the courage to propose marriage to the girl of his dreams. He dropped to one knee. He looked at her beautiful eyes and he said, Sue... I know I'm not wealthy like Tom. I recognize I'm not handsome like Tom. I may not be as well educated as Tom, but Sue, I love you. Will you marry me? Sue was deeply moved. And she responded so sincerely, tenderly. Why, I love you too, Homer, she said. But would you tell me a little bit more about this Tom? Isn't that where we all are? It's kind of like, yeah, we see this commitment that we can make in front of it, but what about this other thing that may be a better option? Again, somebody wrote, we live in what's called a fence-walking world. Ours is a world that has grown comfortable with partial commitments, hedged bets, associate memberships. We want to feel part of the game, but we also want to feel safe in the stands. We want good friends and marriages, but we also want to avoid facing the sins that keep them from being great relationships. We want our kids to be spiritually vital, but we also want them to play travel sports on Sundays. We want sane, healthy life, but we also want one that's packed with all of the possessions and the pace that comes with success. Like the people that Elijah addresses, many today are walking the fence. You got to do this or you got to do this, uh, Elijah says. And so they just stay silent. I don't want to commit. Maybe it's because they don't know the Bible well enough and they lack moral clarity. Maybe, to use Jesus' words, they just lack the moral clarity to make right judgments because they need to know the Bible better. Maybe they lack courage because they don't want to say that Baal is wrong in a generation where Baal wins the popularity contests. They want a partial commitment to the kingdom of God. Enough conviction they have that they don't want to oppose Jesus, but not enough conviction to stand with him. So many people will claim, I'm for Jesus, I just don't like the church. How can you love Jesus and not his bride? They believe in most of the Bible, but not the parts that they find difficult to understand. They believe that God is love, but they don't believe that he's love enough to hate sin or to accept his definition of what is love. Don't love God that much. They want their children to love Jesus, but only to the degree that it fits to their idea of helping their kids pursue the good life through education, and sports, and music, and all the other activities besides the church. They believe church is the hope of the world, but not enough to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not first. 
They believe that human life is made in God's image, but not enough to influence their pro-choice opinions. They believe Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the judge to the come at the end of time. But they also believe there's this firm wall between Jesus and state. You know, gee, don't, you know, I, you know, <laughs> I had somebody the other day say, um, you know, I, I don't need, wrote a note saying, I don't need, I don't need a preacher to talk about politics. It's like, oh, okay. So you, does that mean you don't listen to anybody talk about politics or you just don't want to listen to Bible teachers on politics? You believe in heaven and hell, but not enough to be motivated to share Jesus with your lost friends. Not enough to talk to your Muslim friend. Not enough to talk to your Mormon friend. Our trouble with ambivalence is not a new one, of course. You might call it the Laodicean problem. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus challenges the Christians in Laodicea because they have the same ambivalence for Toward, toward Christ. He, he says in Revelation 3, 15, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of the mouth. You get the idea that Jesus doesn't want lukewarm. You know, he wants them to be hot or cold. Jesus is basically saying, stop wavering between two opinions. Hot is good. You can have hot coffee. That's good. Hot chocolate. That's good. Cold is good. Cold milk is good. But lukewarm milk? Lukewarm coffee? Lukewarm makes Jesus vomit. Any air in your life right now where you're trying to play it down the middle, trying to surf through life as a lukewarm believer, kind of like the Civil War soldier who couldn't decide if he wanted to fight for the North or South. I know this is not a true story. I think it's a funny picture, though. He, he couldn't decide if he, what side to fight for, and so he wore a, the, t the top was a blue uniform for the North, and the pants were gray uniform for the South, and both sides fired at him. Lukewarm doesn't work in war. It doesn't work in life. It repulses God. Any place in your life where right now, if you're really honest, you don't want to take a stand because not because you're genuinely loving, not because you're genuinely sensitive, but because you either lack clarity of values in the Bible or you lack the courage to take a stand. Choose. I'm mostly concerned not... As, as I review this myself, as I, th I apply this devotion to me, I'm... Partially concerned for my actions, as Elijah's partially concerned for theirs, and Jesus is partially concerned for the latest scenes. I'm mostly concerned for what it says about my heart and how my heart needs to be right with God, but first the kingdom. The poet Edward Sanford Martin once wrote, Within my early temple there's a crowd. There's one of us that's humble and one that's proud. There's one that's brokenhearted for his sins, and one who unrepentant sits and grins. There's one who loves his neighbor as himself, and one who cares for naught but fame and pelf. Pelf. From much corroding care would I be free if once I could determine which is me. Who are you? Heavenly Father, make us your disciples. Make us people who, when given the choice between you and Baal, will not remain silent, but have the clarity and courage to take a stand, no matter what the cost. Through Christ I pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us, and hope you'll join us next time.